So hello everyone. Thank you for tuning back in to another episode of the podcast for the Citation Needed Student Group at The Ohio State University, where our mission is to provide opportunities to learn and practice science communication. Today we have a guest with us to talk to us about COVID-19 and the industry, Dr. Emily Campbell. Dr. Campbell, would you mind giving our in- listeners a bit of background about your education and your current position in industry? Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. For uh, starting back uh, with my undergraduate, my bachelor's in microbiology at University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, then came straight to the Ohio State to do my PhD in food science and technology. While there, I was working with Dr. Youssef, and I was doing a lot of food micro work. So that included working with antimicrobial peptides, applying them into different food matrices, seeing their activity. And then I graduated in 2020, the summer of 2020, and have uh, since gotten a job at Abbott, where I work there as a scientist. Yeah, once again, thanks for coming on. So I guess we'll just get started with the questions. So you were in your final stages of your PhD during all this when it initially hit it. So what was it like those initial few months? And then how do you think your colleagues and supervisors in academia responded to the pandemic? It was a very different experience than what I saw my colleagues going through when they graduated a year or two prior. Parts of going into lockdown while trying to finish my dissertation were actually helpful, and there uh, were additional challenges that went along with it as well. Because we weren't allowed to be on campus after spring break, pretty much as soon as we came back, uh, the university was shutting down, so we weren't supposed to go into campus, our offices, or into the labs. So that meant uh, teaching was a little bit more challenging, trying to teach a full lab course online presented a lot of challenges, but we did our best to try to keep it as engaging as possible. Uh, But because I wasn't in the lab and trying to teach in person, it did give me quite a bit more time to focus on writing because I was just sitting in my office at home all day And uh, I didn't get nearly as many uh, questions or like tasks to do around the lab. So I could really just focus on my writing, which was very helpful. I did really miss the interactions with my coworkers and the collaboration that we were able to have in office, uh, but it was a pretty productive time. Due to the COVID restrictions, I had my defense virtually as well. So instead of having a large gathering celebration of students there to celebrate and for me to be able to share the work I'd done, it was all presented virtually. So I sat at my desk at home and to computer to defend my dissertation. It did allow additional family members and friends to attend feeling is having everyone in the room all together and being able to uh, present in person. It was still still a rewarding experience. I really uh, did enjoy getting to share my research with everyone. And uh, as for my colleagues and supervisors, their response to the pandemic They also did be productive with the time that they had at home Uh, from talking with other students and like my advisor and other writing articles uh, since uh, people couldn't be in doing actual experiments. uh, There was a lot of Uh, grant writing for different uh, COVID funding to be able to do some uh, like emergency experiments uh, related to COVID, which were kind of interesting to hear about as well. Uh, But everyone just did their best to try to be as productive as possible without being the uh, in on campus and in the classroom. 
Yeah, I honestly can't even imagine what it would be like trying to fill I'm trying to finish up a PhD dissertation when COVID hit initially, because I remember, so for our listeners who uh, aren't familiar with the class setup, so I was actually uh, taking the food microbiology class uh, when everything uh, went sideways due to COVID. And so I remember the challenges that came with trying to take online classes or working uh, remotely. Um, so I think just from everyone who is taking the food microbiology class, we would like to extend you a, uh, a very warm gesture of gratitude for the work that you and the other TAs put into making the thing uh, accessible online. So uh, since, your, um, since your experiences finishing up your PhD, how has your um, life in industry been shaped by COVID? Uh, how has your day-to-day -day work, like life and uh, other things like that, affected by it? It's definitely been a unique experience. I started my position during uh, a lot of the COVID restrictions. So when I uh, was interviewing for the position, it was all virtual. So again, sitting in front of my computer, talking to a screen and hoping I was uh, conveying what I wanted to without being able to actually interact with uh, people in person. And I did get the job. And when I started, I actually had my work laptop mailed to me and I started working from home. So for the first several weeks, I was having virtual meetings and get, kind of getting everything set up, some of the onboarding. But I, I didn't meet my boss in person for a, a couple of weeks and had to meet a lot of my coworkers virtually as well, setting up a lot of one-on-one -on -one meetings. So it it took a little bit of extra time just to get acquainted and start to meet everyone, but I was so happy with how welcoming and understanding everyone has been so far because it is a, a very different experience trying to understand the company culture and understand all of the products that we work with, all trying to do it virtually. So it's been great that everyone's been very welcoming and flexible and willing to explain things. So uh, I can really start to, to get moving on projects. And as for day-to-day -day work, now that I've gotten a little bit more established, I do work for a food company and uh, production of food is essential. So we are still uh, producing food and implementing measures to keep uh, everyone as safe as possible while working. So part of my job can be done virtually, so I do still do quite a bit of work from home. And on days where I do need to go in and do experiments, there are a lot of safety measures in place. Everyone's wearing masks, of course. Uh, there's temperature checks, weekly COVID screens. Uh, if you are going in, uh, the capacity is much smaller. So right now, uh, they're just, you go in and the office is pretty much empty almost because there just aren't very many people that are in the building. Uh, but we, we are still able to go in and get experiments done, do some batching, which is really helpful that I have been able to uh, meet coworkers and actually work with products, but uh, just with a few additional barriers in, in the way to make sure everyone is safe while uh, making product in person. Yeah, so then some of the more prominent foodborne viruses that we are aware of are those like the norovirus or hepatitis A. So early on in the pandemic, the FDA released a statement saying that there was no evidence that SARS-CoV-2 was being transmitted by food and or food packaging. As someone with an extensive background in food microbiology, what is your take on this statement? And do you personally feel that food could serve as a likely transmission vehicle for COVID? And then before you answer, um, I did get food safety certified that year when COVID started happening. And I remember my mom asking me, she's like, what do you think? Should I wipe down the groceries? So I was just like, just to be safe, you might as well do it. So do you think I put extra fear into my mom or you think that was a justified response for me? <laughs> I personally like to think it's always better to err on the side of caution. So 
there's so much with COVID that we don't know yet because we just haven't had time to run all of the studies. So taking a few extra precautions to wipe down groceries or, you know, make sure you're washing your hands a few more times using more hand sanitizer. I don't think that's necessarily uh, a bad thing because we don't have all the answers for it yet. Uh, as long as it's not being taken too far, like you do still need to uh, be able to make food and uh, keep your mental health uh, a priority as well. It's, uh, it can be overwhelming with all of the with all of the precautions, but they, uh, from the evidence we do have, they they do keep people safer. Now, do you feel like food could serve as a transmission vehicle for COVID, despite what they say? So, like I said before, there's still so much that's not understood about the virus. I know with FDA. Uh, statements and claims saying that there's no evidence, they don't often go beyond that saying like this is not um, a, a risk or something like that because they, they leave it open because there could be more evidence that comes later, especially for something that is this new and unknown. Uh, and from the general understanding right now, the major route of transmission is through respiratory droplets. So it is possible that those droplets, if someone coughs or sneezes onto a food package, then that person would have to touch the package and then like touch their nose or their eyes or their mouth without washing their hands um, and get enough of the viral particles to uh, actually become sick. So I think it, it is feasible that it could be possible. I don't think there are very many or if any at all, documented cases of that occurring. Uh, but it's also a little bit hard to know exactly where everyone gets the virus from. Even with the contact tracing, you don't always know exactly where you caught it. So while it is uh, possible for packaging, I would say it's the, the focus is more on the air transmission of the the virus and if you're talking like products like not just on the packaging but like in the food itself i think that would really depend on uh the virus and the food matrix because there are viruses that are able to uh remain viable while in uh the food matrix which isn't always the nicest environment um and then when you, when you put on top of that proper food preparation and hand washing again, that, that limits it even further. So I don't think the risk is very high there, but it could maybe be possible. I think we'll just have to wait for more research to be done. Yeah, that's kind of the, the thing that I've seen a lot of people and agencies obviously struggle with communicating effectively is kind of the uncertainty around a lot of the topics that we have to talk about regarding COVID, like safety precautions and, and, and those sorts of things. But for, for us, for food scientists or just scientists in general, how do you think we can better communicate concepts like the importance of mask wearing, vaccines, hand washing, that sorts of thing to the public? I think there is kind of an of uh, distrust in various agencies and scientists, political climate. That's the United States and also globally. Uh, from some of the traveling that, I done, uh, that I've done, I've seen the issues surrounding implementation of solid fact-based science uh, being used to help people because if uh, the community you're trying to help is not receptive to the intervention or new methods that you're trying to apply not going to be effective. So one of the things that I think uh, could be improved for helping communicate the these concepts and how important they are, I think it needs to be a collaborative effort across scientific, scientific disciplines and also um, kind of outreaching to communications and uh, public health experts and community leaders to help 
get the general population to understand and gain acceptance of these important safety measures because scientists can talk and it if if the people aren't understanding what they're saying or it's confusing because of the way scientists are talking about it, it's not really helping. But if you community members or work with public health experts that have to translate the science into something that's more meaningful to the community, that can be really helpful to educating the population so that they understand the importers and the impact they can have. And one kind of target area that I think has been utilized in some other safety implementation is helping to educate children as well so that uh, you can help them understand the importance of some of these measures and then they can take it back to their families and help educate them as well because it can sometimes be hard to reach the general population but if you can uh, help educate children they have a, a broad reach uh, to their families. Listeners, you heard it from Dr. Campbell herself, being able to distill down complex scientific topics is a very, very important skill to have as scientists. Okay, so there's some research shown that the COVID-19 pandemic beginnings were linked to a seafood whole market, and it was suggested that it was an annual humans transmission based on a published peer-reviewed article in Frontiers of Microbiology. So is this a common occurrence for a virus to be transferred to humans and in the future, should it be a concern for consumers of different animal products? So going back to my micro undergrad days, I did actually take a virology course and did some research with viruses. So I do have a, a little bit to say here for kind of viruses in general. Uh, typically, they are very specific for uh, what they can infect. So like a virus that can infect humans, it's typically not going to be able to infect your dog or your cat because uh, it just doesn't have the right receptors to infect cells of a different species entirely. And even the cells that they can uh, uh, infect within your own body can be uh, very different as well. And it's, it's actually pretty rare for viruses to hop from like a, an animal to a human or human to animal. It doesn't happen very often, but if it does jump from an animal to a human and then is spread human to human, that's where you have some of these disastrous consequences uh, because it's a new virus that the body doesn't have uh, immunity to. We haven't seen it before. We don't have vaccines for. So it can be really dangerous as we're seeing unfold right now. Uh, typically this can uh, kind of some of these new uh, viruses and uh, oh, it can come from mutations that allow the virus to jump to a different species uh, and co-infection with multiple viruses in the same animal can also affect some of that if they're sharing some genetic information, they're kind of rearranging, that's where you can get some of these new uh, very infectious uh, viruses that emerge. And like I said, once it makes that jump to humans, if it then can spread human to human, that's where we have a problem. Sometimes it can make that jump from animal to human, but it doesn't really spread to other humans. It's not so much of a concern unless you work very closely with that animal or um, you're eating food that's not properly prepared. Like we were mentioning earlier, some of the uh, foodborne viruses, as long as you're preparing food properly and uh, the person preparing it is following proper hygiene protocols and it's not sick, it's not too much of a concern, um, but you do wanna have those measures in place to make sure if there is a, a virus in the animal that it's not coming in contact with um, people where it can then spread. So. I would say it's not a huge concern for the average consumer. It's definitely something to keep in mind when you are uh, purchasing and preparing food. You wanna make sure you're getting it from a, a good source. So going back to your experiences uh, in industry, 
Um, so j just in general, various sectors of transmission within the facility. Yeah, in industry, there are many procedures in place to try to keep the food that they're producing as safe as possible and also uh, import high quality ingredients that uh, also are safe to then use in their food product. The level of care taken really depends on the products being produced. So if this is a ready to eat uh, food product that doesn't have much process, be really careful about uh, the, like say produce that you're bringing in. You can do some cleaning, but the cleaner it is when it comes to you, the higher quality uh, down the line and say for a vulnerable population like um, infant food or uh, for hospital uh, special dietary concerns, uh, you have to be really careful about the ingredients going in and the, the processes that the food product is undergoing. So in general, uh, plants will follow good manufacturing practices to try to keep everything clean and uh, sanitary. So there are still going to be those critical control steps where you're applying heat or you eliminate uh, pathogens and spoilage microbes, but you don't always want to rely on those. You want to make sure the food coming to that control point is as uh, free from microbes and viruses as possible. So this includes uh, making sure that workers are maintaining proper hygiene, wearing captive clothing, hair nets, and now uh, masks the uh, other workers safe. And I've also heard of being introduced, trying to space people out, uh, things like that, just to try to keep the workers safe from spreading uh, the virus to each other. And this also goes for cleaning and sanitizing equipment that like high food uh, touch con the food contact services and also uh, close areas, making sure that bacteria and microbes are not getting established and then uh, getting on all of the food products where then uh, you have a persistent issue with like a biofilm uh, getting into your food product. So a lot of what the industry tries to do, at least from uh, what I've seen is a lot of preventative uh, measures to try to keep the risk as low as possible for the food that they're producing. And then of course, uh, at the end, there's gonna be some, uh, in some cases, finished product testing to make sure that everything's going according to plan. Uh, a lot of times there will be uh, validation experiments run as well to make sure that the process that the food is undergoing is achieving the level of kill that is required for their pathogen uh, that's most resistant that they're concerned. Yeah, so then for our listeners that aren't aware of this, when you're um, in food safety courses or taking food microbiology courses, you're taught in order to kill bacteria in food samples, you have to cook the food to different temperatures. So for example, for chickens, cook it to 165 or above for salmonella. So as far as you are aware, is the coronavirus able to be killed in this temperature range or in another temperature range? So for viruses in general, it, the, their susceptibility to heat really depends on the virus structure and also the environment that it's in. So depending on the food matrix or if it's just in suspension, that can play a big role on how susceptible to heat it is. And I do believe that heat is used to disinfect uh, masks and other PPE so that it can be uh, reused safely uh, in like, hospital settings because there is a, a shortage of some of these uh, equipment to, to keep people safe. And I, I did a little bit of digging uh, to look up exactly what temperature and time is being used to uh, kill the virus. So from what I found online for the SARS COVID uh, virus in general, not necessarily the COVID-2, uh, it can be the nucleocapsule protein can be completely denatured in 10 minutes at 55 degrees Celsius. 
And then after incubating at 65 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes, it has been completely innovated. And uh, there were additional experiments done because uh, that was looking at the virus, virus particles in suspension. And so when you have them in uh, like a serum or something with high proteins, that time requirement down to just 10 minutes at 65 degrees Celsius. So it, it kind of depends on the, the environment that the virus is in, um, but definitely heat is being used to inactivate uh, the virus and it is effective. Well, that's good to hear, at the very least. <laughs> so um, going back to the communication aspect, because of course that's uh, what the whole goal of Citation Needed is. Um, what sources of what, or websites would you suggest to individuals who are looking for trustworthy advice about food safety or about the COVID uh, pandemic in general? I think there are a couple of great options that are a good resource for anyone who wants to learn more about food safety in general and COVID and potentially even the combination of both of them. The CDC has a lot of great information, trustworthy advice on COVID, uh, different practices that you should follow. They even have, I know when uh, everything was starting and we needed to wear masks, I was looking at the CDC for how to make my own mask at home because I didn't have uh, any surgical masks. So they have a, a lot of great resources there for just general information about the pandemic and uh, current guidelines on how to keep yourself and those around you safe. Then for information that's more specific to your area, if you wanna understand uh, kind of what's happening on a local level for you, checking out your local government public health websites can be a great way to find additional resources as well. For example, the city of Columbus uh, public health has a COVID portal related questions if you want to talk to a person and get some live answers for the information on them up for testing sites near you so you can get some great information about where you need to go to get tested that's convenient for you and of course they have additional reports and resources if you want to do some more digging into uh, the specifics about the pandemic and uh, since this is citation needed just remember that the the, the science takes time to figure out and then communicate it to uh, the general population as well. And the scientific understanding uh, can change over time as new information is being added. So make sure you're checking back on those websites to make sure you're following the most up-to-date procedures to keep everyone as safe as possible. Absolutely. And the changing nature of science is one of its greatest strengths. Uh, in my view. Dr. Emily Campbell, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to come on our podcast and talk to us. Uh, Alec, do you have any other questions? No, I feel like you covered any questions I would have wanted to ask, and you're very thorough with everything. And I liked how you made the point that things are always changing. It depends. There's multiple factors that go into this, and that people just need to be patient with science and just listen to the experts. Thank you so much for having me on. It was uh, great to talk with you and I definitely learned along the way when I was looking up some uh, answers to make sure I was information possible. All right, everyone. So yeah, thanks for listening. So depending on what platform you're on, like, subscribe, leave a nice review. And then once again, if there's any audio issues, we apologize. We're just starting out with the podcast. As we go on, that will be fixed.